Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Renewable Energy Institute's uh, uh, panel conversation roundtable on the outcomes of COP28. As a request, please make sure you turn off your videos once you uh, enter the room and keep yourselves muted throughout. Uh, my name is Alexander Lewis Jones, and along with my colleagues here, Marta Oliveira and John Wilson, we will be guiding you through a conversation uh, over the next hour all about COP28 and what we thought about it. I'm going to begin by uh, doing a quick introduction um, to the three of us, and I'm going to start by asking Marta to uh, to give us a quick introduction to herself and her expertise, and then on to John, and then I will talk a little bit about myself. So over to you, Marta. Thank you very much. And first of all, just thank you to the REI for organizing the webinar and, and for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Marta Livaira. I'm a guest lecturer at the REI. I teach the carbon finance and the carbon capture and storage courses. Uh, it's good that I can see some of uh, the participants here. So uh, a good way to, to start the webinar. I also work at Ikigai. Uh, it's a net zero bankability consulting and co-development firm. Uh, we work mostly on decarbonization of core infrastructure. So this includes wastewater, airports, ports, logistics, how to abate sectors, basically. Um, and specifically, what we do is looking at the project structuring to make sure that they're bankable and attractive for investment. Uh, hence why here the link with uh, the financing outcomes from, from the COP today. Uh, specifically, I've been working on the sustainable transport fuels chain um, and here the connection with carbon capture and also Bex projects, which uh, happily I, I can address today from a more carbon markets perspective as well of what happened at COP. Over to you, John. Right. Thank you, Alex. Yes, that's uh, an interesting day. Uh, thank you for inviting me to take part. I deliver the photovoltaic solar course and I have been doing that for a number of years. My background was really from PV cells, uh, developing amorphous silicon ones in the old days, and moving up to now when PV is definitely mainstream and uh, an important component of renewables around many countries. So I look forward to addressing some of the questions that people have raised about PV uh, batteries and related uh, implementation questions. There probably won't be technical ones today. Great, thank you very much. And my name is Alexander Lewis Jones. I am a transport and climate uh, expert uh, with a specific focus on battery electric vehicles. So for the last eight years, largely since the uh, the COP in Paris, I've been very much working on how do we get these uh, electric cars out onto onto roads? How do we help build up the charging infrastructure for that? And ultimately, what is the carbon emission savings of not just electric vehicles, but all forms of transport? How do we avoid these emissions, shift to alternatives or improve the vehicle solutions that we've got today? Um, so I am the lecturer on the electric vehicle course, naturally, um, but have a wide range of interests across from carbon emissions through to all different transport sectors. So. Uh, I'd be really looking forward to uh, discussing some of those interesting issues with us today. Um, I will also be uh, chairing the, the the conversation today, but I would say that this is a conversation. So think of it more as a, a friendly chat uh, between the three of us, and we want to involve you. So please make sure that you send in your questions uh, through the chat, and we have our fantastic uh, Renewable Energy Institute team helping out with technical things in the background and highlighting any key questions that may come up. A quick run through of what we're going to do today. We're going to start by um, going through the, the high level view of what came out of, of COP28 um, with some very up to date uh, insights based on what's been happening early on this morning in Dubai. 
Then we're going to go into some specifics uh, relating to our different individual specialities. So with Marta, we're going to explore um, what, what she found particularly interesting around um, the finance side of things. For John, we might go more into um, the, the renewable energies. And I might bring in some, uh, some additional content around uh, electric vehicles and, and transport agendas generally. At the end, we will have time for Q&A. So if there are any questions that perhaps sit outside our current conversation, we will uh, capture them there. And apologies in advance if we don't get through to all questions. We appreciate there's a large number of us on the call today. Um, so before we get started, uh, just a quick intro to uh, the Renewable Energy Institute. Since 1975, uh, we've been a, a leading global provider in renewable energy and energy efficiency training, and we provide CPD accredited courses to people from now over 150 different countries across the world. And through our uh, collaboration of different expertise, and as we've seen with quite a diversity just on, on this call already, we have been collaborating with government departments and even the United Nations, uh, the Environment Programme, has been supporting our work. The Galileo Master Certificate is awarded directly by the REI and is recognised as a pinnacle uh, recognition for training in the fields of renewable energy and energy efficiency. And there's a whole range of other courses available for you. Take a look online and you'll be able to see that there is um, on-demand de on uh, study available, as well as some of our live virtual classrooms. I really enjoy that because it means I get to have more interactivity with the participants. Now, if you would like any further information about the uh, training at the the Institute, um, then please send an email to us or give us a call. But let's kick off with that high level view. As we know, um, COP actually went over time. It's, uh, it's, we think it's finished today, but there's still updates coming through. And the key thing about COP28 was um, this, this discussion about the, uh, the global stock take. So I'd like to uh, invite um Marta and John to to discuss this with me just to make sure we're all on the same page I'm going to literally give you the pages of that of that document that was released this morning um and I've just put that into the uh, into the group chat now that should give you uh, a, a link that's accessible uh, to the UNFCCC website. This is the the draft document that was signed up to by all parties of the of the conference, uh, posted at seven o five local time in in uh, Dubai. So they're working right through the night, negotiating at ne negotiating at five a.m. to get this done. Now, what's important to know about the global stock take is that this is the first review of progress on implementing that, that Paris Agreement. So we had that really big um, uh, COP back in uh, 2015. Uh, that was the uh, the agreement where we signed up, where we're going to go towards this um, net zero target, aiming for 1.5, well below 2 degrees. Now, seven years on, we're, we're halfway towards 2030. So how much progress are we actually going from taking that decision of setting a target to actually implementing it? And within this, um, uh, within this link uh, that if you can access it, you'll start to see loads and loads of paragraphs. I just wanna pull out some of the key words that came out, which are really significant generally in terms of climate politics. And largely, it's all around how um, we are thinking about technology transition. Uh, so first of all, there is a commitment in there to focus on tripling renewables by 2030. We're looking at a phase down of unabated coal power. There is wording around the move towards both zero and low carbon fuels. And generally, there is this wording around a transition away from fossil fuels. From my area of interest, there's a um, there was wording around the rapid deployment of infrastructure and zero uh, for zero and low emission vehicles, and we've heard a lot of talk about the phrase phase out. Phase out was used for um, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies that 
And these are ones that do not address energy poverty or the just transition. And to quote uh, Wopke Hoekstra from the EU, um, he said, you know, for the first time in 30 years, we might now reach the beginning of the end of fossil fuels. So it is a historic moment, um, but uh, that's that's what the text is saying. And there's certainly a lot of positive and negative commentary coming out of Dubai since that came out this morning. So now to, with that as the um, the starting point, I wanted to, to move on to my colleagues here to see generally what do they feel um, about COP28, maybe about that statement or anything more generally. So I'm going to pass on to to Marta uh, to ask you, what, what do you think was positive? What was negative? And what kind of new questions came out of, of it for you? Well, the, that unpacks a lot. Um, it's two weeks of uh, a lot of discussions, but I think the three key points that sort of came out of it for, for me was one, we got to a point where we can get to a stronger direction for parties. So it was actually, although we've been discussing for quite some time, 30 years, where the first draft where we actually have the transition away from fossil fuels included on the final agreement, um, that's quite significant in terms of a policy move. But then we need to see how we're actually converting all those pledges and ambitions into an action and how we are actually disclosing that with, with transparency. The, the second point is around climate financing. One of the key areas that these COPs normally address is financing for ju just transition, specifically the move of money from developed to developing countries uh, that not necessarily can focus their older financial ambitions into climate change, because they also have other uh, very urgent priorities. But in terms of climate financing, although it's still not there in terms of the commitment that we wanted to reach, which is about 100 billion per year, there were a lot of pledges around financing and specifically of public and private blended financing. This is an important point because the only way we're going to actually close the financing gap will be with private financing crowding in. The only way we get the private financing is where we prove that climate change is not just an urgency, but it's also a commercial opportunity being very pragmatic. And it's good to see how we've seen from the pledge side, not just public financing into UN funds, but also specifically other funds, for example, CIP and other investors, which are directly going into technology deployment and uh, are investing in opportunities that are considered bankable for the market and bankable for them. So I think that gives me to, that goes to the third point. The third point is around recognizing that there is technology availability for mitigation acceleration. As you were saying, um, Alex, in terms of the agreement to triple the renewable energy capacity, this is very relevant to show the world that the technology is there. Yes, in a lot of other sectors, we still need technology development. I can say that I work on the Hatu Bay sector side, but there's also a lot that can already be done in terms of investing, but also deployment of those technologies. And although there are other constraints around the networks, there is the technology availability, the costs have been coming down, and therefore there is a pathway forward in terms of actions. And I think those were sort of the three positives coming out of the COP. Uh, obviously, as every year, there's more work to be continued, uh, specifically because there was a recognition that the efforts done so far on the national determined contributions are not on track for both the 1.5 global warming reduction target, but also not even for the two. Um, I think the the stock stock has had some wording around 2.1 to 2.4 with the more recent national determined contributions, which obviously needs to come down. But also it means that all of the pledges on those national determined contributions actually have to be delivered. So that's the key point. Um, questions that came out for me I think the main question is how are we looking at all these pledges all this discussion 
and putting it in practice? And two, how are we using these frameworks, not just for deployment of decarbonization action, but also for transparency on the disclosure and specifically accountability and data sharing from the different parties? It's still difficult. There's a lot of commercial sensitivity information there. But how do we make sure that we get to an actual global collaboration in pushing the transition forward? Because I think in the end, that's really what we need to reach and what these conferences can allow us to do. It's to enhance that global collaboration. Great, thank you. John, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, in addition to those ones, um, I think there are a couple of things that are worth emphasizing. Um, first of all, it's certainly been very good that uh, we have at last uh, recognized the importance of one or two things that didn't appear so much in the previous Paris one. Also, the the, the center position of finance in the way that the, the loss and damage uh, fund has been agreed more strongly than before. And this, of course, is going to be pleasing, even if it's not yet the scale required by countries that are really under threat of major climate change without being able to say, we caused it. Uh, so many countries around the world are seeing the impact of that without having really the ability to do much about it themselves. So that loss and damage fund that's being set up with uh, commitments of large amounts of finance from various other countries will help to go towards the damage caused by them. And of course, should encourage countries to actually say, hey, why should we keep paying this out? We need to do something about the cause. So that was one good thing that happened very early on. It's certainly important that uh, the new target to triple renewables has been put in writing. Uh, that's good. Uh, and of course, alongside that, doubling energy efficiency, although the date is by 2030. So again, it's being pushed a long way into the future, but that doesn't mean that it will wait until then for things to happen. And so that combination of particularly electrical generation by renewables and uh, making sure that our energy efficiency is better across the whole sector, whether it's uh, domestic heating, whether it's for transport or whether it's industrial, all of those are targets that need to be attacked, as we've heard. So I think putting those down has been really good. Um, there are some local things that have been happening in the UK and in Europe as well, which are illustrating that that has been recognised by combinations of nations. And I think the collaborative aspect is really important. It's not something that nations will go on their own about it, mainly because they don't want to see them losing out commercially by adopting expensive measures. But also, you've got to work together on such a big issue. Uh, it also brings in agriculture and food and water, which has been mentioned perhaps for the first time as important sectors that do involve emissions, but are also have to be put up in the front. And again, particularly with my PV interest, there is at the moment quite intensive discussions going on as to how much PV can be put onto uh, productive agricultural land as opposed to using it as PV. Um, setting aside any discussion about raising crops on land for energy use rather than for food. So food comes first and then the energy comes afterwards and the discussions are very interesting in the way the two together can help uh, these targets that we've been set. And perhaps just to mention that today, for instance, the UK uh, has just announced that the carbon intensity of electricity generation for our last quarter fell below uh, 150 grams per kilowatt hour for the first time that measure uh, any records have been taken. And the way that that carbon intensity has fallen, in other words, the emissions have fallen, is partly large uptake of renewables, but also lower demand. So we have to look at that, because as we change to a more electrical economy in many countries, the demand will rise again. So all of these things are interlinked. It's a complicated technical picture as well as a very complicated financial one. Fantastic. Okay. And I, yeah, I think collaboration is a really key point there. Um, in terms of my own reflections over the past couple of weeks, 
Um, I've seen a few, yeah, positive signs. And I, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, John, there about including food um, for the first time. Uh, I remember going to some side events in Paris at, at um, COP21 and people are starting to discuss what, you know, how do we de de decarbonize this? But it was very much off the uh, off the record. It didn't want to be um, considered. Um, so as soon as we start opening up those dialogues, um, we can start to helpfully build some multi-sector collaboration and start to see how different sectors can can benefit from the innovations that are coming out of others. Um, and that's something I maybe want to bring up later on, specifically around electric transport. Um, there was some progress on, on methane, so not talking about carbon dioxide, but um, there was certainly ambitions raised there around the methane pledge to go near, near zero by 2030. It wasn't widely well received. Um, I felt that a lot of the climate NGOs were, were unimpressed that the these all companies who are responsible for for flaring, um, uh, you know, could have gone much fur further, much faster on that. But still, it's it's positive to see that there's there's movement there. Um, I wanted to also discuss what what pe what what your thoughts were on, you know, what does COP have an identity crisis? It feels like post Paris, um, we've got this agreement and we're moving into this implementation phase, um kind of the reality of what a cop is and what actually happens on the ground is perhaps very different. And just to highlight one statistic, 97,000 people attended this um, this conference this year. That's uh, about double what was last year, which was the, the previous record holder for the amount of people attending a cop. Now, these are people that have um, capturing data from people who've, who've got a registered pass and Dubai is a you know is, is an exposition uh, capital of the world so it's it's possible to host that many people it's got the uh, infrastructure there it's got enough hotel rooms it's got enough spaces for for people to do this but it does feel like there is a bit of a momentum shift in terms of what COP is doing and I've also seen that there's been a lot of people very frustrated that the hopes and dreams that they had coming out since especially Paris and then of course Glasgow two years ago haven't necessarily been realized and that there's a lot of blah 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 um, as um, Greta Thunberg um, coined two years ago in the run-up to, uh, to to Glasgow. So it feels to me that this is the most anti-cop cop certainly from the media and the networks that, that I've been in but what we are seeing is a shift in what civil society is doing in response to the Paris Agreement. Businesses are growingly using this as a platform for international collaboration. And as we see the emergence of you know, key bilaterals coming out, rather than this big unilateral text that we described earlier on, is actually an opportunity to see, hey, can we find a way where private finance might work in this country with the support of that country and, and pulling all this together? Um, you know, it's, it's a coral reef of these different bilaterals, right? There's no nice common system, but we're starting to see different uh, things emerge and progress being made, particularly from pledges that were made in, in Glasgow. And I know I'm being quite vague here, but just to pull on some, yeah, the methane is a, is a good example of that, that started in Glasgow and progress has been made. I would also come back to um, Marta on your point around the... Uh, uh, yeah, hard to abate sectors. And we're starting to see uh, campaigns that didn't exist a couple of years ago, like uh, Steel Zero or Concrete Zero, where we're trying to bring together early adopters of other technologies, say electric vehicles, looking at Volvo here, and they're looking at their whole supply chain and being like, well, electric's great for tailpipe, but we need to go beyond the tailpipe and focus on what can we do and how can we get sustainable steel? Is that a thing? What what technologies are in there? What kind of CCS or other solutions can we, can we enable here? Um, so my question just back to you both on that is, you know, how do you see COP evolving um, over, over time? And do we think that this is becoming more of a, is it a, a, yeah, a festival for all things climate collaboration? And is there, is it transitioning away from the traditional negotiation model? Uh, Marta, I'll go, go to you first and, and then John. 
good question. Um, I guess that's the question that's always in everyone's mind, specifically with more and more people working in the sector and looking at what it takes to actually deliver projects on the ground. And there's a difference between the actual delivery of the projects and then what happens at more high level at COP and those discussions. I think the first point is we need to address the elephant in the room. We are trying to transition a whole entire network that has been here for hundreds of years to something that's completely different in 50 years. So there is a lot that comes with that. First, there is infrastructure that needs to be ready and needs to be ready and deliver security of supply. That's not easy. There's a lot of aspects around de-risking of that network that needs to be addressed, either in the power sector, but also on the heat, and then again on the transport sector as well. We need to make sure that we can transition, but we can transition effectively so the wor world keeps running. Then there's a second point there that's complicated, which is about the transfer of funds. It's about the prioritization of funds into uh, climate and the, the climate transition, while there is still other aspects ongoing in the world, macroeconomic uh, aspects that also are sort of taking that money out. We are in the middle of a crisis, we're in the midst of wars, and we also need to recognize that although it's a very important trend in a lot of situations, it's not just the one trend and just the one thing that we're focusing on. And I think the third point really is there, there are profitable businesses going on right now in oil and gas. This is true. It's still supplying a lot of the world energy and it's still keeping the world running. So I always get back to the point on, there is an ambition around COP. There is an ambition around a net zero transition. And that was a great outcome of the Paris Agreement. But because we're on an implementation phase, the implementation also comes with looking at these different perspectives and actually how do we together, one, create an opportunity around the climate transition. So it's not, not just about an ambition and it's not just about decarbonization. It's actually a commercial opportunity. That's what was going to get both public and private collaboration and understanding and alignment to pull the money forward and pull the technology forward and the efforts forward practically and pragmatically that's what that is what needs to happen so that is what i want to see in the next cops um and for that i think the key thing that the cops can deliver is two things the first one is about commitments but what does that mean so commitment in terms of how do we can make sure that we have a forward on direction together and we push the countries even and even more to sort of more stringent action around the targets that we have, but also that we really define these frameworks on how are we moving forward. So the frameworks are around a couple of different things. It's around the delivery of the actual action, and this is either on the technology of renewable energy deployment, but it's also about the financing frameworks. So we can have these funds, and we can also look at carbon markets, but we do need to find global ways of shifting the money from one side to the other, still looking at deploying it in an attractive way for investors, enhancing confidence from investors and developers on that many transfer and also on the actual delivery of the project. The delivery side is the skills. And sometimes what we forget is if we do want to shift the complete industry in 50 years, we need people that actually know how to shift that industry. And people are learning, technologies are developing at the same time as we're going forward. So that skill side is very important as well to make sure that the infrastructure that we're putting now that will be there for the next 50 to 100 years is also the right infrastructure. So we are actually future proving and making the world more resilient and not just looking at a fast paced transition, but actually that in 50 years from now might not be working that well. So I don't think the identity at COP is wrong or has been lost. 
I do think that the implementation challenge comes with a lot of perspectives, a lot of views and a lot of risks and, ch and challenges that need to be overcome and need a lot of discussion. But as long as we keep the aim on global collaboration and global collaboration in terms of actionable steps and actionable financing moving forward, that should help us get to the point that we want to get in the next years. Yeah, a really good point there about it's not just it's so much about the money, but also we need the skills. <laughs> we need the it's all the parts of the resource that that enable things anything to happen in, in any kind of business plan. And if I'm a if I'm a a country a party here, I'm thinking not just about where's my finance coming from, but also who's going to be actually delivering this. And there's a there's a huge opportunity there, right? Um, for 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 green skills, um. John, I'll pass on to you, to your, to your thoughts on, on the future of the COP. Yeah, I agree entirely. I think uh, this was an enormous event and it probably was therefore more inclusive than many have been in the past. Um, you mentioned before as well that more industries were along and there were separate showcase events uh, on the sidelines demonstrating what can be done by industry. And they're obviously there because not so much they want to protect their own interests, but perhaps they see the opportunities and as you said, those opportunities are going to require people to actually take the jobs on. Um, it's interesting, even in the PV field alone, uh, and linked to that, the battery one, that of course, at the moment, the successful deployment of PV around the world is almost entirely Chinese product. They really have dominated the world in production. And it's it's unfortunate because it means that everybody is relying on that supply line. Uh, as a result, there's overproduction. The prices come down, companies go bust. It's not stable. But it does mean that maybe too much expertise, at least part of that supply chain, is being concentrated in one country, just as bad as if it was in one uh, industry. So Europe is looking at attempts, just as America is, at trying to develop their own industries. And that has to happen across other areas as well. Um, again, it needs massive amounts of finance. We've said that already. But that is certainly one problem, that there is a shortage of skills and maybe the technology is too concentrated in some cases into a few suppliers. Uh, even though on a more local scale, bottleneck of implementation is often in electrics. It's just the grid system. And the big delay is connecting up. Uh, the waiting times for connection to the grid in many countries is really making it very difficult for co companies to exist because they're having to wait before they get their money back and then they have to reinvest and so on. You can see the problem. So, yes, it's a massive problem. Yes, um, it's been tackled by lots of people talking together at the same time and it therefore looks quite, quite dense and difficult to find out what's going on. But there are, underneath all of this, agreements being signed using COP as an opportunity between countries, between uh, industries and countries. And I think that means that that's the action going on in the background that we're maybe we want to see happen, but it doesn't always take place in full view. So I think there is a lot happening from now on. And I'm also uh, very pleased to see that there's been much more inclusion of uh, the youth panels and that I believe that uh, youth is going to be particularly involved in future COPs. So that's good because, after all, people like me are not going to be around when these some of these uh, real problems hit if we don't solve them. And it's really important to take views as well as uh, show that it's an opportunity. Uh, maybe just one final comment uh, that does link to something that was said. The next two COPs are going to be in Azerbaijan, so we're going to see another oil-rich nation involved. That's going to set up its own problems. Uh, will the oil industry stand by what they're committing to do in reducing casual flaring and reducing their emissions of methane? Then it's going to be in Brazil, which brings in the whole question of the Amazon and the rainforest protection and money going for that. Because, as Brazil says, Brazil says, we're looking after this, but it's for the benefit of the world. The world should pay. And there is a new fund, of course, that countries are paying into to support that. 
So I can see that when COP moves to other countries, it introduces local threads from those countries that might just produce some actions ahead of the game, which wouldn't have happened if they weren't going to be in those countries. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting one. Um, putting Azerbaijan in the in the in the limelight um, will be will be fascinating because I, I imagine certainly me I don't know much about the uh, country and certainly those the kind of the ambition that you bring forward with the presidency as we've seen with UAE is 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 really pertinent there. Um, it has been a fascinating time to see how exposed the fossil fuel industry has been with a ceo uh, of a of a of an oil company running the the presidency and i think that's led to a lot of the 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 quite jarring or uh frustrated tensions both at the cop and just generally in the global media i think these things the history of them is all about the optics as well the overriding um image for me was of 12-year-old Lissipria Kanguyam, uh, apologies if I pronounced that name wrong, but the uh, the young Indian uh, activist who stormed the stage um, uh, one or two days ago and, um, you know, saying, we've had enough, you know, the, pro the progress being made at these, um, in these talks is, is insufficient. <laughs> we, you're, you're ruining our futures. Um, and the response there was from... Majid al Suwaidi was give her a round of applause to, for her enthusiasm, which um, I know was well intended, but obviously came across like we're not really solving the the key problem that the youth are really driving for. So yes, I'm totally with you on including uh, the youth, um, people who are extremely articulate and extremely young age. Now, Moving uh, moving on, I'm conscious of time. I just wanted to come back to both of you in terms of your sector specific um, questions. So come, we've talked already a lot about finance, Martha. So thank, thanks so much for that. Um, I'm really interested to hear more about this. If these opportunities for for blended finance, so this this combination of of public and private. Um, are there any um, good examples that you've seen of of where this is this is happening, um, or something that's that's come up at a at a COP or or otherwise, and any other kind of key points that you wanted to 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 highlight there around around finance? Um, yeah, over to you. Well, I guess the best way to respond to that is to say what we've seen so far. This at least two big frameworks, let's say, of how to deploy money between countries from the pledges at COP. So one is around funds. And on funds, we've seen those funds to finance mitigation, but also to finance adaptation. So to finance mitigation, I guess we can talk about uh, the Green Climate Fund. There were a lot of pledges from different countries and companies into the UN Green Climate Fund, which is for developing countries um, looking at adaptation and mitigation practices. Um, but then on adaptation, I guess the big finance point here is on the operationalization of the loss and damage fund. Uh, what that means is, as, as John was mentioning before, this, this is really the biggest framework that COP can bring in terms of uh, getting the most vulnerable countries in terms of adaptation to climate change and the fact that uh, a lot of countries are already uh, suffering for uh, from consequences of climate change uh, and to really get uh, financing to be able to deal with extreme weather events, or with the droughts, flooding, rising seas and other types of uh, uh, weather events there. So that's the fun side. Then the other key aspect, and I think more and more this has been something completely highlighted on COP last year as well, is the carbon markets. The carbon markets can be a great framework to enable globalization in terms of carbon efficiencies. So as you just said, Brazil says, well, I can give you a lot of carbon removals, but I need to be paid for that. And so there's the financing mitigation, there's the financing of adaptation, but there's the financing of removals. And the financing of removals is important because it's also critical to reach net zero. The IPCC 
has indicated in, in, in previous reports that you do need a removal to get to the 1.5 um, global warming target. Um, and so there's a lot, the only issue with the carbon removal market is integrity of the market. So every time we establish a new market, we obviously need to go through a process of having the necessary confidence on the supply side that the projects are being developed well, but also on the purchase and the sales side that they're actually financing what the aim is to be delivered. And so this COP specifically had so many things happening around the joint frameworks to ensure the, the integrity of the, the voluntary carbon markets. So both on the demand side, uh, we saw SBTI uh, and VCMI uh, pledging on joint frameworks for how, what is the right way to use carbon credits against our net zero voluntary targets? Can we use it against all scopes? Can we use it in which situations? Is it a beyond the value chain mitigation? When is the right time to use carbon credits? That's very important because we also need to standardize how we do mitigation versus offset. And then there's also, uh, there, there was also a pledge around a framework on the supply side, which basically all the accreditation standards that are approved by Corsia, which is the, the key ones, um, they pledge to keep uh, working jointly on frameworks for high quality credits. That means, continuing to approve projects and the strict criteria to make sure they're they're actually delivering the benefits that they say they are delivering. This is key for uh, market confidence and it's key for the markets to be able to really scale up and, and get to the uh, global levels and uh, the investment required for them to bring on th these networks. But I think the really key point that brings, that gets out of the carbon markets is nature. So you've mentioned food and agriculture before, and I think the other very important aspect of the transition is nature. We can obviously uh, develop um, the full energy system and other systems um, in, through engineering human action, but what actually balances out all of that is nature. And so if we don't, if we're not aware of its benefits, both on the carbon removal side, but also on biodiversity net gain, nutrient neutrality. Um, that's really what's going to get us to the right balance and for the future proving of the planet in 50, 100 years more. And nature was all over COP. Um, finally, very happy to see that it is being seen as the next thing for investment and with the developing of high integrity frameworks, that will be possible. It's not the next thing, it has been there, but finally we're finding ways of making it bankable and we're finding ways of monetizing these benefits. So basically we're uh, using the language of practical commercial opportunity into nature and this is enabling us to move forward. So on the financing side, I think that's really the two key yeah. areas where we're sort of converting what the aim into something that actually deliverable and that was very clear from from the COP this year great so um um we're getting a lot of questions coming through and we will address these might run over just a couple of minutes if that's okay um i just thought i'd weave in a few for you now Marta, just around um the finance side of things and particularly as you were saying there about all these new systems being built up that are on a global scale and you know how do we how do we get the money from perhaps the global north to the global south, one key area of skills is, and perhaps infrastructure is around you know, setting up um, the, the systems in place in um, uh, countries that might not have the same level of banking systems or the, 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 all the different ways that we transfer money around. So um, there's a question about uh, that came in here. What about the non-recognized countries that have low financial literacy? Do you have any any plans for them so just a general question there um and also there was a question um that is will ne neatly perhaps lead on to john afterwards but around um 
in your opinion, was there any clear commitments or intentions to reach agreements, political and finance wise, regarding cross-border interconnections between different countries or regions of the world? So I would uh, approach that in terms of, it might be electricity grid connections, we're seeing Africa connecting to Europe, for example, but it might be other forms of supply as well. It might be around green hydrogen, for example, being collected in one part of the, uh, the world and being taken uh, elsewhere. We're certainly seeing that in the, in the sustainable fuels sector. So just two, two comments there around finance in terms of literacy for, for um, poorer countries, but also any, any thought around those kind of technology mechanisms too. Well, in terms of literacy, that's a very good point. And I think that just comes back to the point around skills. So another thing that I think it can it's good to come out of carpets about education and education of the different countries and how you can be more efficient globally on the funding requirements, but also on how to deploy the right technologies where it makes sense and how to make sure that the countries know what the big, their best resource is so that they can use it in, again, a commercial opportunity, the best way to actually move forward. Um, so they didn't particularly mention, I guess, um, uh, large frameworks around, or very specific frameworks around literacy, but definitely the UN has uh, a lot of programs that uh, supports that. And just coming back to John's point around inclusivity, this is one of the things that's really key when there's the wording around just transition. So it's not just about energy poverty, but it's also about how to deliver or how the, those countries can use these opportunities in the best ways for them. That's why also they are putting together the high integrity frameworks. One of the key reasons that countries were getting concerned was that they were giving away their benefits basically at a very low cost. And that's not beneficial for the developed countries as well, because basically you might not enable the actual mitigation decarbonization that we need to do. But it's also not good for the developing countries, which at some point were not getting the right benefit for the 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 well the resources that they were deploying. And so it is addressed. Um, but the follow up on that will be definitely UN programs that can support these countries and how to frame uh, their assets and how they can um, best use them for for uh, the action around the world, how they can use the funds that are being put together, how they can use these market frameworks that um, that that are being developed. Um, the second question uh, was about cross border agreements. From what I've seen, there are a couple ways where this happened um, publicly. So in, on one side, we can see green corridors. So one of the big um, uh, announcements was around green corridors, specifically for shipping and maritime. This is about sustainable fuels for the sector, but it's also about how do we make sure that we're producing, for example, hydrogen in where um, the energy is more available, where it's cheaper to produce, where there's more resource, and then how do we uh, transport it secure in a secure way to the countries that also require that demand. So there is one shift towards sort of local regional um, production and use, but there's also an understanding that in some cases, in some situations, we do need that global um, effort to be able to uh, reach the commercial um, and the competitive prices for to enable the transition to move forward. So definitely um, seeing agreements on that basis. Uh, but then there's also a lot of bilateral agreements happening, for example, taking back on the nature point side, uh, bilateral agreements between countries that want to finance credits and project developments around a first station, around habitat restoration, about uh, other types of uh, nature projects and interventions. Um, so there's already uh, a lot of bilateral agreements on that basis. And then basically the structuring around the carbon markets is just going to build on that. So they are actually able to do the transaction, but the enabling bilateral agreements, um, ha they were previously made before COP and they keep being made uh, in parallel. Mm, very interesting. I'm I'm really interested in these emerging concepts around not just planting trees, but also planting 
charge points for for electric vehicles in other parts of the world and um and collecting the uh the avoided emissions from that some interesting concepts that have come out on that i wanted to segue into john conscious of time um for your thoughts on this and maybe i'm just going to throw a few questions that have been coming in thank you for all of these um there was one thing about right at the beginning about energy efficiency and i don't know whether this is your um your area but if there was anything that you know around the global cooling pledge which i believe is around air conditioning and and uh, a, a program to to bring countries together to to align on low carbon cooling and um, the other one that's just come in was uh, what are the promising technologies and plans outlined for expanding renewable energy access in developing countries so over to you john yeah thanks those are both really interesting uh, we haven't time to do a lot of detail, but the cooling one is uh, important. Obviously, in UK, we don't sort of recognise that. You know, here we are today under four degrees, five degrees here in Edinburgh, and it's been pouring down for days. But we have to recognise that the cooling sector uses a lot of power around the world. Um, it's predicted, I think, that greenhouse gases will uh, more than double by 2050 if we don't do something on there. And I know the sister company of the Renewable Energy Institute is uh, definitely interested in enhancing the uh, more efficient cooling systems and removing some of the gases all around the world. So there is a lot of action going on. It's being driven as well by not just by legislation at the UN level as well, but also by companies. Uh, so it's really important that, uh, first of all, to remove the gases in cooling that are potentially dangerous, and secondly, to reduce the power consumption. Mm -hmm. And I think what they did say was something that if they applied measures to reduce the power consumption, it could cut something like 60% of the emissions. So the cooling sector is very big. It's a very technical sector, but I think it is being addressed very well. And I suspect that anyone who is really involved in this should look at the UN uh, EP programme there's a global cooling watch report, which is going to be addressing this and seeing what's happening. So cooling equipment could be consuming as much as 20% of the world electricity consumption at the moment. And it does tend to get overlooked by us in the North. So very important. And I think it is being addressed, but there's probably more to be done. Um, on the general question of helping and uh, implementing renewables for developing countries, they have been the target of experiments for many, many years, uh, from anything from the small scale solar cooking right up to uh, implementing new ways of, uh, of transport. They still remain a very important lab, if you want to look at it on that point, because any company that is developing a new product that at all addresses renewables, storage, uh, or any of those technical issues needs to be able to demonstrate that it works in the countries where it will have the biggest impact and perhaps where the biggest challenges are. Um, Temperature-wise, PV, for instance, uh, efficiency goes down as it gets hot. So you put PV panels in the sun, they get hot, their efficiency drops. This is well known. It's forgotten sometimes by people uh, promoting and selling PV products into countries where that is the climate and it has to be allowed for and there are various technical ways of doing it but it is just a point to remember that if you are working with another country, remember what the local conditions are, not just the financial ones, but the technical ones. There isn't a single answer. If it's renewables that uh, can be brought into a country that at the moment does not have a very big national grid for electricity, for instance, or a gas system, that's an advantage because at the moment, mini grids and local supply of fuels are going to be far more efficient and far more attractive uh, for the climate as well as the people. So I think there are a lot of opportunities there that are being met, but only on such a small scale at the moment. Combinations of solar, wind, thermal, storage, whether it's thermal storage or battery storage, all of these can be done technically. They need to be demonstrated on site. And it's probably not happening at a fast enough rate, but it could do. And also, unfortunately, we don't have our hydrogen expert from REI here with us today. Uh, he's traveling from COP, I believe. Uh, but John is uh, a very strong advocate for hydrogen as an energy vector and for the ways in which it can solve some of these problems of intermittency and uh, local supply. 
And that is something that certainly is going to involve cross-border agreements for uh, generation of hydrogen, transport and use of it in all sorts of ways. Uh, perhaps I should stop at that point, Alex. <laughs> um, just a quick one to, to you both. Do you have time for another um, five or, or ten minutes? Yeah, yep. great. Okay, I just wanted to check there. So we'll we'll stay on the on the call for a little bit longer because we've got some great uh, questions. I realise that I've not been doing a good job at sticking to my clear agenda, and I haven't really talked much about transport at all. Um, perhaps a good good segue there coming in with um, tr uh, hydrogen. Um, generally, um, the the view from a from a transport perspective, they. Yeah they host a, a transport day a lot of the dialogues are are focused on key sectors um and electrification is of course a major um steals a lot of the limelight a lot of the time uh, because it's very easy to to actually bring electric cars and buggies and driverless pods and things to a cop to demonstrate um, a lot of the big companies that are startups in the space are there trying to demonstrate to the world just how important they are as part of this decarbonization decarbonization process there is this year has, has perhaps boiled up to this question around are we picking winners technologically are we saying right we've got to go 100 percent to this uh to electricity and we're ignoring all the other um solutions if you look at that global stock take text you can see that um the certainly the final narrative is very open very much focused on decarbonization low emission fuels low emission vehicles that kind of dialogue is still there this is the kind of dialogue that's been phased out in countries like mine here in the uk where people are more talking about zero emission solutions in terms of the debate between electric and or batteries versus hydrogen, I feel like that has matured a lot. Um, a lot of it, the, the narrative at the moment is around commercialization and people who are building up these big fleets of electric trucks, for example, are very much focused on the com commercial opportunity today and what they see is their return on investment that they're going to make. So as a result, that's why we're starting to see a lot of battery focused solutions, really heavy vehicles, purely based on the fact that batteries are just further along on their technological readiness than some of the hydrogen uh, applications. And certainly that's been reiterated in some of the uh, the conversations that have come out um, during Transport Day at the, uh, the COM. So um, I wanted to just focus on any other key questions uh, before we, we finally wrap up um martin just coming back to you there was a, we had a question earlier on about um special or higher carbon taxes on on some industries um where the return can support transition projects have you come across any specific carbon tax narratives or some new projects that have been coming out well, I guess the carbon tax comes also on the specific sectors where we try and get um a better ambition to to abate. So I assume that where we talk about carbon tax, there is potentially uh, in the situations of uh, the unabated uh, fossil fuels as well, and how we are trying to push for that in terms of uh, the ETS markets as well, and the obligations around uh, decreasing the emissions for those types of industries to come down. So it's the balance between um, the taxes around the consumer as well, um, at least in the UK, not from new crop, but uh, the balance for the carbon tax and the ETS system is the carbon tax taxes on uh, the fuel, well, the fuel duty around the the requirements for 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 the consumer um, that purchases uh, diesel, for example. Um, while uh, we see the ETS more on the taxation, it's not necessarily taxation; it's more sort of more an obligation. Um, for in, in in the producer side, so in terms of the uh, oil and gas refineries and and also on on the power input side, um, but I guess moving forward and definitely around uh, the transition away from fossil fuels, we'll definitely see more taxation, especially on on the consumer side. Great, thank you. Um, we had a question here about um, how do you propose to help developing countries skip 
uh, oil and gas production phase and go directly to renewable production. I feel like John, you've you've covered aspects of 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 the the challenges and and opportunities there with uh, renewables in in developing countries. Um, one thing I would just add from a from a transport perspective, a lot of the narrative is around. Uh, getting out of our kind of automotive focused narrative that a lot of us in decarbonizing transport are stuck in, certainly here in, in Western Europe and North America, and focusing on all the other solutions that already exist um, and helping to empower certainly cities in Africa to, to not go down the um, rapid adoption of low cost electric cars, but instead focus more on the two and three wheeler markets that already exist today. Can they be electrified and can we solve air pollution problems there? And also look at the minibus uh, solution, which is um, really common across across different cities in uh, Southern Asia and, uh, and Africa too, and finding niche ways to build out the the, the charging infrastructure for those, which naturally leads to a co-investment in renewables too. Um, I, I I know that it's it's not as easy as just putting a few solar panels on top of a charger and expecting everybody to be able to charge that amount. Um, it, it it requires much more uh, planning, but you, we are starting to see some little microgrid systems coming together, and that that energy system is 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 a really interesting one. We, I've been involved in a few projects where they are introducing this bi-directional charging technology for buses with local renewables and particularly in areas where we're seeing um, more natural hazards. So let's take the Caribbean, for example, when it's hurricane season, their local grid, which is not super resilient, uh, we might just lose energy to, uh, to buildings, uh, to schools, to hospitals. Um, we're working with a project to get school buses to be become electric and with some tech that's come from the Europe and North America, we're enabling those buses to send their electricity back out of the batteries and into areas um, to make sure they can keep the power on and not move towards uh, the diesel generator solution. So there's there's some interesting nuances there. If we focus on those projects and scale them up, then there might be an opportunity to avoid going down the the the, the petrol route. Um, so that that was my my answer there. I'm conscious of time. Um, I wanted to just wrap up now by asking everyone one question: What is your one ask for Azerbaijan for Baku for COP twenty nine? So um, this time I'll go John first, then then Marta, and then we'll finish. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Um, Yes, I think the global stock take um, is still phrased rather vaguely. Uh, parties are encouraged to submit economy-wide, nationally determined uh, contributions. I think that is going to have to be looked at uh, seriously and criticised as the period builds up towards the next one to see what countries have promised as their targets and as their contributions to reducing emissions and energy use and to see whether it's actually feasible and to start discussing it. It's not one country competing with another. It's really to see if uh, measures being made in one country are possibly able to be made in others. Uh, I think it's a great pity for various reasons that we're not in, officially in Europe, in the UK anymore, because there are some very large uh, cross-European initiatives being taken which will help that to go on quite a way. And we haven't had time to discuss agrivoltaics today, but that's an area where Europe is really looking at putting in the regulation that will enable food production areas to also produce power. Um, and that, of course, will compete with energy crops as well. So there's a whole number of things there which will work. I'm just throwing one extra point, if I can, about uh, PV panels. We're seeing large solar farms set up around the world where... The economics are often for the investors who want their money back, uh, of course, in a short period, but they're looking at it as an energy, as, a, as a financial uh, uh, source, not as necessarily saving the world. As a result, it makes sense for some of the big solar farms to replace panels which are working with the latest, much higher efficiency panels. Now, those ones that are taken away are not for recycling by uh, breaking down. They're really for reuse. And I think there's a business to be made there, which probably hasn't developed properly, 
in supplying panels, batteries, and systems for mini grids, not necessarily individuals, for mini grids for countries that are trying to set these up. Panels will work perfectly well. I think there's an economic, there's certainly a technical sense in using that. So that's just one thing that could be done to help countries that are trying to set up their own power distributions. They could do it without having to buy new panels. Great example. Okay. Marta. Um, for my side, really, it's the commitment for a bank bankable transition. How do we see the next COP? Again, being a step forward into the implementation side, and I think the implementation, as discussed a couple of times today, is really going to come from a bankable transition. How do we make climate change a commercial opportunity? And this is all about the right policy. It's about the right innovation efforts, having good value and high integrity partnerships and really pushing forward green delivery skills. So this will enable us to get policies uh, for carbon price squeeze that really uh, help us justify investment into decarbonization solutions. This pushes for technology development as well. But at the same time, it justifies investor confidence, push for, pushes forward these public but specifically private investment crowd in and this is what will get is the market standardization but also the actionable points for for the next years to to come great and i think just to add to that i would say uh i agree with everything that you two have just said i would uh, just say collaboration and finding these interesting opportunities for cross-sector um and cross-border um, integration of ideas, essentially, is really coming together. Um, we've talked a lot about skills and training. And of course, uh, here at the REI, um, this is what we're all about. So I would just say a big thank you to uh, my colleagues, Marta and John, uh, for, for joining us. And um, I believe that's, that's everything for today. We'll see you again on another REI webinar. Thank you very much.